Okay, uh, let's start with a little exercise. I would like that all of you stand up. Yeah. <laughs> and that you do groups of three. Okay, so do little groups of three. You don't need to take your things. You, not, you don't need to know each other. Groups of three, not four, not five. I know you're very creative. Just groups of three. Okay, now I want that three. Everybody's got a group of three? Yeah, three here, three there, three. Yeah, good. Now, I want that two of you, only two of you shake hands and look at each other in the eyes. Only two of you. Keep shaking hands. Okay, now shake hands, two of you shake hands. Okay, how are you feeling when you sh keep shaking hands? How are you feeling? Are you feeling? <laughs> are you feeling excited? You're probably happy to be part of the group. <laughs> You're probably happy to be part of the group. You are looking at each other in the eye. You're feeling some kind of warmth. Now, for a moment, think about the person, the third person in the group, the one you were not shaking hands with. What did that person feel like? Maybe he or she felt disconnected, felt like, yeah, I kind of belong to the group, but they don't care about me. I'm here, but what am I really doing here if they're not looking at me? So this is the way that a person that works in a distributed team feels like, feels left aside, left alone. And we're going to talk a little bit about some strategies to pre prevent these feelings. Okay, so you can sit down now. Yeah? <laughs> problems that we encounter when... Problems that we encounter when we work in distributed teams. You know all of them. It's a lack of communication. You feel disconnected from the team. There's no trust between team members, no sense of duty, no binding culture, which leads to loneliness, boredom, and ultimately to unmotivated people. So let me give you a little bit of background uh, so you believe what I'm going to say during the next 45 minutes. I'm here representing Ricaris. Ricaris is a company that's uh, based in Spain. We were, we've been in business for six years now, and uh, we started 2009. It was a moment when Spanish web pages were very successful, and they wanted to grow outside of the Spanish market. They wanted to be in Europe, they wanted to be in France, they wanted to be in Latin America, they wanted to be in Russia. And they needed somebody that would uh, do the translation for their web pages, that would do the customer service, that would validate the content, that would create content. So they contacted us. And we are in Barcelona. It's a very cosmopolitan city, yes, but there is not enough talent there. There's not Russian people there enough to do this job, or not enough French people, not enough Italian people. So we're thinking, well, how are we going to build a team? And we said, well, what if we got the best person to do this job, no matter where they are in the world, no matter the country, let them work from the best possible place, so if they want to work from home, if they want to work from a co-working space, if they want to work uh, from a little office that we'll build for them, pay them in the best possible way, and at the same time retain the flexibility as a business uh, to be able to move in the changes that the, that the market is going to bring to us. So we ended up with a 100% distributed team. We were not distributed because somebody decided that was a good idea, not because somebody thought it was cheaper, not because we merged with another company. We were born completely virtual. And we ended up in 25 different countries and working around the clock. At a moment when there were a lot of uh, companies that had already distributed teams, but um, we were native. We used the technology and we ju were just born like that. Let me give you some numbers that might be a little bit surprising for you. Um, even though we're fully distributed, more than half of the people in our team 
uh, have been with us for more than five years. People are not leaving. We take care of them, they don't go. We have met in person only seven out of 228 people that we, f we have had working in our company. It is, is practically <laughs> incredible because when first people tell you don't go distributed, second thing they tell you if you go distributed, meet every six months, meet once a year. Well, I no, have not met half of the people that work with me. And we have spent less than 500 euros in travel budget. This does not buy you a single plane ticket to the United States or you know, nowhere in the world. So how have we done it? How have we managed to have a successful distributed team without plane tickets, without hotels, without um, yearly meetings in Miami with the rest of the team? Well, we have invested all that money that we would normally invest in, um, in plane tickets in our people. So we have a team of two psychologists that have designed activities, events, um, meetings, have created rituals. So the distributed team feels like they belong somewhere. We are not trying to emulate what a traditional company is. We have created something completely different. It's a different mindset and uh, we have created these activities. We have invested all the money we would normally put in plane tickets and coffees and beers and uh, dinners. We have put that in our people, showing that we care, develop, developing them and creating an environment that's as, uh, as good or better than the traditional one that we know. So let's see the details. First thing, first key, the, the talk today is called Keys to Managing a Virtual Team. The first one is recruiting. Not everybody can work distributed. Forget about it. Um, it's very important that your human resources team understands the difference between having somebody in the office and having somebody in a, in a remote office that's going to be working remotely. People need to have the experience, people need to have the skills, people need to have the emotional intelligence, and if the person's going to be working remotely, needs to have other characteristics. Needs to be autonomous by nature. Needs to have a little motor inside that makes them go. Okay, how are you going to uh, find out if a person is autonomous by nature? Well, your human resources department for sure knows what to ask. What I ask when I meet with somebody is simple questions. How are you going to organize your day? Imagine tomorrow you start working with us. How are you going to organize your day? If the answer is, well, I was hoping you would tell me about that. That person's not autonomous. Look for a different answer. Also, we need self-motivation. When you're in an office, it's easier to find motivation. You, you know, we're, we're social animals. Uh, we, are, we need to be with people. When you're distributed, you're kind of alone. You just felt it with the exercise, right? So a person that can be a self-motivator. How do I find out? I ask people about the changes in their lives. I ask, okay, um, when you went to university, did you choose that because you wanted? Well, no, my parents wanted that not a self-motivator. Uh, do you live in this city because you chose it? No, no, my wife told me that we should move here. Well, do you have kids? Well, you know, all my friends were having kids. That person is not creative, it's not proactive, it's just responding to all the things that are happening to him or to her. And it's not a person that's able to provoke change. If a person that finds motivation and it's self-motivated is going to provoke change, at least in his or her life. Also, you need a person that's a good communicator, and at least in writing. So when you're interviewing somebody, look at the emails that you have exchanged. Are they, is the person being able to articulate the thoughts that he or she has or not? You need somebody that can express themselves a little bit. And this one's not so worrying because you can work on that. The one that's really important is that they relate to your company's vision, mission, purpose, and values. That's the one that's really important. Because um, it's, it's the thing that at the end motivates us. It's the passion he was talking about. 
when we work for a company, yes, we need to be happy, they need to pay us well, but we need to thrive. We need to feel a passion for what we're doing. Otherwise, the motivation is just going to sink super fast. So make sure during the interview that you ask <coughs> the typical question, why do you want to work for this company? But go deeper, go a little bit more clever. For example, one of our key values is quality. So we always ask in the interview, tell us about your favorite restaurant. Okay, some people say, well, my favorite restaurant is the one in my neighborhood because I go there with my friends. Okay, no problem. You're not good for us, but uh, you're very good for other companies. You're a social person, you enjoy, you're loyal, you enjoy being with your friends. Fantastic. I'm looking for a person that can appreciate quality. So the answer that I want is, my favorite restaurant is that one. I can only afford to go once a year, but the quality of the food is great. The quality of the service is great. The place is amazingly decorated. I want a person that can connect with the values of my company. So first key, super important, recruiting. If you don't have a good recruiting process, forget about having success in your distributed team. And this is kind of an exception. During the recruiting process, the person that does the interview needs to start setting expectations. You cannot wait until you have the person in the company to show them what it's going to be like. You need to start explaining how hard it is because it's hard. It takes more effort. It takes more time to be working in a distributed team. So start explaining how hard it's going to be at this moment because otherwise they'll get scared and they'll leave after a week. So start here. Second key, company culture. Your company needs to be ready to be working remotely. And I think this is your main problem. At least from my experience talking to people, companies are not ready to understand that, um, that distributed teams are something else. It's something completely different. We're, we need to have a mind change in order to work distributed. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background about my company because otherwise you won't understand how hippie we are about some things. We're called Ricardis Have a Nice Day. Have a nice day, why? Because the purpose of our company is that our clients can have a good day. They can externalize all the non-core tasks. They can focus on what they do well and don't worry about the things they send to us. And have a nice day because our second purpose is that we want our workers to have a good time. We want to help them reach their goals in life. We want to help them know what they want and what you want changes during your life and help them get to that place. That's why we're called uh, Have a Nice Day. And all of the actions that we do are towards these two objectives, helping clients achieve their goals, helping workers get where they want to get in life. So how do we transmit this? We start with the first day at work. When you go to a normal office, what do you do? You walk in and you see things. You see the logo on the wall. You see if the receptionist is nice or if she's crying. You see, or he's crying. Um, you see what people are like, what their desks are like. The desk is decorated, the desk doesn't have any information. Um, you see what people are doing inside meeting rooms, or maybe you don't see the meeting rooms because everything is dark, or you hear people yelling at each other. You're perceiving things constantly when you're working in a normal company. If you work in a distributed team, you don't see anything, you don't perceive anything. That's why we created what we call the new higher tunnel. <laughs> and uh, imagine, right? It's a tunnel you go through, people walk with you, and they show you things. We show the new hire what it's going to be like. We set the premises. We do that um, in three steps. The first one is the Good Vibes Handbook. If you speak Spanish, Buena Onda Handbook. Good Vibes. What is that? That is a book. It's written, but it changes continuously. And it's not the founders who change it, it's the people. Uh, that are part of the team that bring things into that. It's a book, it's written, it's a PDF, you can print it, and it has the rules or the no rules. There's two rules in my company, no bullshit, no politics. The rest, we change all the time. So here it's a moment where we set clear expectations. What is it going to be like to be working in the company? 
and it's, it's like a foundation of a house. Then you can build whatever you want on top. But we give them the premises. We give them like, um, like a platform where they can depart from. When you're working remotely, it's very hard to ask questions, especially the first week. You don't know who to ask. You don't know what channel to use. If you ask something, it suddenly becomes really big. So here, we just give them a lot of information about what to expect. And it's like a place from where they can work. And from there, they can grow in different ways. The ground rules, I told you about the, the two rules. And it's a good moment to break paradigms. We're talking about a multicultural team. In Europe, we are different. But you know what it's like to work with people in India, work people in Latin America, work with people in the States. You know, the cultural differences are really big. So this is a good moment to say, OK, this is what we're about. This is what we expect of you. For example, we were working with really young people fresh out of college from Latin America. And they thought, well, great, I'm going to be working for this multinational company. Wow, I'm going to be working a lot. I'm going to be learning a lot. But I'll be doing a lot of extra hours. They're not going to pay me for these extra hours. They're going to be treating me like shit. Because that's the idea that they had of multinational companies in Latin America. Well, first day of school, first day at work, we tell them, no, you're not going to be working extra hours. If we work extra hours, there'll be a reason, and we'll be doing something to fix that. You'll get paid for all these extra hours. You are going to be treated with respect, and you're going to treat people with respect. Whoa. They step back. What is this? This is not what I was expecting. And of course, it's just theory. But then you have to work on it every single day with your actions and with your words. So good moment to break paradigms. Um, we show we care. We do speed courses. We said one of our um, purposes is to help our workers achieve their goals. How do we show we care? Well, we, we help them work distributed. In school, well, at least when I went to school, they didn't teach us how to work in a distributed team. So we work on communication. We work on motivation. We work on stretching. We are really um, caring a lot about the body, you know, because otherwise people, they just get, you know, some of them are working from home. They don't put their pajamas on. Next thing you know, there's problems here. There's problems with the eyes. So, um, showing that we care. And probably from these courses where we teach them how to communicate better, uh, where we teach them how to uh, be more autonomous, maybe they don't remember everything. I don't expect them to remember anything. The only thing that I expect them to remember is that we took the time, that we spent hours, that we invested time in their development. If they don't, didn't, didn't remember afterwards, I don't care. But I want to show that I care about them. And then we do a daily mentoring during the first two weeks. And this really depends on the kind of company, the kind of work that people do. In our company, the work is really repetitive. So with two weeks meeting with each, with the person we have enough, but that's something that depends. And all procedures must be very well documented and they can be changing all the time. Yes, it takes time, but uh, it's worth it because it gives some kind of security to the person because otherwise they're thousands of kilometers far from you. The fact that they have something written and that they know that in a month when they have more knowledge, they'll be able to go back to that document and add things because they'll be part of the team gives them a security. So we talked about implementing. Now let's go to how to keep the company culture. And here the idea is repetition. Some companies believe in the spray and pray. Spray ideas, Ooh, pray that they're going to bloom. No, we do not believe in spray and pray. We believe in repetition. We are talking about people. We're talking about behaviors. So we repeat constantly everything till the end. But we do it in different ways, right? Um, the main people here are the team leaders. They can be your scrum masters, managers, whatever you want to call them. Um, they're the people that set example because they're the ones that are constantly in contact with the team. So they, they need to be really aligned with the company values. And they're the ones who are all the time caring about the team. And this is really clue for us. 
to that the, the team leader understands their role, not only as quality control, making sure the project deadlines are being met, making sure that everything's going good, but taking care of the people because they're, they're far, you know? They, they feel like the third person in the group today. So it's, it's clue that they're always knowing what's going on with the team and with assertive feedback. Now, how do we achieve assertive feedback? I don't know if familiar, yeah, you're, you're very familiar with the term. It's not saying yes to everything. It's staying strong, learning to negotiate in a non-aggressive way so you can find your way, but um, with a win-win for everybody. And uh, how do we achieve assertive feedback? Most of our communications are by email. So what we do is we write the email, and I advise you to try this. Write the email with the feedback, positive, negative, no, the feedback. And then uh, before you hit the send button, you rewrite the entire message. Um, you rewrite each and every sentence. So every sentence is constructive and it's bringing some value to the person that's going to read it. The idea is that the person that receives the message doesn't feel like, oh my God, this person that's in Barcelona is telling me what to do and now I don't know what to do and I did it wrong and now I'm sad and what the fuck and uh, I don't want to work in this company anymore but they pay me well. No, the idea is that the person's going to read it and it's going to feel Oh, somebody cares about me. Somebody took the time to show me a way or to ask, better yet, to ask me the right questions so I would find the right way there. It's guiding me. Somebody's caring about me. I don't want to disappoint them. I'm going to do a really good job. And this is what you get when you use this positive feedback. And it takes a lot of time at the beginning to rewrite every email, but then after a while, it just comes natural. And it comes natural in your normal conversation. She <laughs> so uh, I advise you to try it, you know, try it for a week. Next, how do we keep these distributed teams healthy? Well, first of all, you need to know who is in your team. You need to know their aspirations. You need to know what makes them thrive. Who are they, right? He was talking about listening and he just stole my, uh, my sentence. You know, we need to be very active when we listen. We cannot be what they taught us to do, huh? judging all the time. Okay, now when he stops, I'm going to say this. When he stops, I'm going to comment on how, on about that idea. No, you need to let the person explain while you're listening, only listen. Do not think about, do not judge what they're doing right or wrong or what you're going to say next. Just listen. And at the end, if you want, make questions, see, whatever you want. But listen to the team, make open questions, let the people express themselves and help them find uh, their way, you know. Um, what, we work with personality tests and we work with one in Canada, uh, they're called Play Prelude. I can give you more information afterwards if you want. It's amazing. We change all the time. We take this test every six months, and every six months I'm like a complete different person. But there are some traits that are natural to each person, so it's very important to know who the people in your team are. Is uh, this person in the team more analytic? Well, maybe I can count on some tasks with this person. What happens when you do that? The person feels like they did uh, something right, that they can bring some good information uh, and some value to the team. And, um, and the team gets to know each other and you can create some dynamics. Trust. There's a lot of people that talk about trust in distributed teams, how we achieve that. If, you, if people don't know each other, if you know, don't know people, you cannot trust them. So the very first thing is that your company should be investing time and should be investing money in team members knowing each other and knowing each other in more psychological ways. And another way is with, through team activities. Team activities, I have here some cards. If you want to take them, there's some team activities depending on what you want to achieve. If you want to achieve better communication, if you want to achieve synergy, uh, if you want uh, icebreakers, I have cards. You can come pick them up later. Team activities are a great way for people to meet, to relax, to build something. Our friend uh, Jovan here, Jovan, <laughs> uh, gave a talk yesterday about games. 
you can use some of those games. I use the word team activities, but there can be called games. Um, check his, his, his um, uh, slides because they were really good. And in our company, we have a meritocracy, which really helps with trust because um, we do not hire people from outside to be in managing, ma management positions. Everybody comes from the bottom. So that, that really helps with the trust issues and empowerment. Know what people want, know where they want to get, and help them get there. It's only going to help you. Now, uh, with, uh, I'm going to skip this a little bit faster because that's not the fun part. Um, but we do weekly feedback. And I know that you have daily meetings, but still, uh, it's very good that you have an extra meeting that maybe it's not about work, that maybe it's just about fun, where, you, where the people in the distributed team are just going to be sharing an hour of time. And, uh, and also the, the leaders should be providing feedback to every person. Again, working distributed is the same. No, it's not the same, but it just takes more effort than working in a normal office. So if in a normal office you do feedback once a month, here do feedback once a week. Everything more, all the communications are more. Show real support, you know, and I say real. I don't mean like, oh, no, I'm a manager, now I have to go talk to people in my team. They're always saying the same, no, be real. You know, try to connect, try to tune with the people in your team and help them grow like that. It's, it's going to be more fun. Show warmth in all the communications. One of the things we teach people is that in emails, there always needs to be an introduction and a goodbye. Um, always start the message. Hi, Anna, how are you? How, how was your time in Croatia? Or uh, did you watch Game of Thrones last night? You know, Put something a little bit personal. You're going to be knowing those people. You're going to make things easier. When you're working remotely, you need to grease up the relationships more because you are not having coffee with the people, right? Um, and super important, repeat why each person work is important, right? Um, and repeat it in many different ways. And repeat it in every meeting that you have with your team. Explain how well your client is doing financially, how well that product that you finished is doing, how well people, real people, try to find real examples of people finding benefits in what you're building. And involve team in goal settings. <coughs> Key. We always say, Enricaris, if somebody doesn't meet their goals, it's not their fault. It's because we didn't recruit well, we didn't train well, we didn't set the right goals, we didn't pay attention. It's the company's fault. <laughs> All right, so in normal companies, when people are getting tired or you start feeling that the, something's not completely right, or just for fun, you say, okay, guys, it's Friday afternoon. Let's go to the cocktail bar. Let's, let's have a couple of beers, blow off some steam. Well, distributed team cannot do that. So what we invented is a monthly congress where the objective is just to have fun, to blow off some steam. And I'm going to go through this with detail because I don't expect you to follow every step that we do in the congress, but I think you can find interesting ideas in it. First of all, we start with an introduction. Fun, relaxed, good times. We talk about personal things if we want, or we can do an icebreaker if people don't know each other. And this, I recommend that you always do every day during your send-ups. Spend five minutes, invest five minutes in people doing small talk. Do a small activity. Ask them fun questions, you know. what. Um, what is the song that you're listening to repeatedly all the time? Show us this song. What, um, I don't know, stupid questions. What, um, what did you do last night? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's <laughs> it's funny. Could be embarrassing. <laughs> oh, it could be embarrassing? All right, then. No, no, if there's people that don't want to get personal. It's true, it's true, it's true. But um, you can ask questions just to grease things up, you know, to make things a little bit m more smooth. And, um, and I recommend that you do this. Even if your meetings are really fast to those three questions or how many you're doing, uh, depending on how creative your team is, at question number zero. And that 
has to be a social question, something that will make things easier. It can sound like a time waste when we're all running, but it's an investment, seriously. After we do the icebreaker, we move to what we call into the circle. It's a moment where we share information about how the company is doing and how the teams are doing. This is the issue of transparency that we were talking about the other day. He was talking all the time about uh, creating safe environments when you're working in a distributed team. And one of the keys is transparency, is to show how the company is doing and to show how the team is doing. and. What's amazing is that if you do that, if you share even your problems or your worries, the team, if they are truly connected with the company, is going to come back to you with amazing answers, with amazing solutions, things you would never think of. They, of course, the, the people thinking. So they bring them up, and if there's trust, they will uh, bring them there. Then we have a third part of the meeting and uh, with team leaders it's a course or a development activity where we bring somebody from the outside that talks about certain topic always developing but aiming towards uh, working distributed and then uh, with team members this part is not so much about development it's more about bonding and belonging the way we have our teams organized is that um, the team is formed of people who do the same job, but in different languages. So it's a great opportunity for them to share how um, they're finding solutions. We bring up in every meeting, we bring up uh, <laughs> different problems, and then people from the team come with solutions. How am I solving this? Don't be alarmed because of this. OK. <laughs> just close the door. We're just going to burn, but we're fine. <laughs> Um, so people in the team are bringing solutions and they feel very well and they feel like one day I'm bringing the solution, next day somebody else will. They're bonding, you know, they're sharing information and at the end we do a fun activity. Always, always end every meeting with a high note, end the meeting with something fun. If you're lucky enough that you have a person in your team that's that kind of person who's always funny and everybody likes, then use that person as much as you can. Otherwise, you'll have to get creative, you'll need to find fun activities. But always end every meeting, especially the long ones, with a fun activity because the energy boost that that is going to bring you is going to last you a long time and you want to find that all the time. Now. Let's go to motivation killers. First, communication. How many of you work or are in a distributed team? Let's see. Okay, how many of you would you say that most of the ones that work in a distributed team, that most of your uh, communications are with only conference call, not video? So mostly, you do video? You, you do mostly conference call? Okay, okay. Then I'll skip fast because I think that you're doing pretty good. But the other day I was talking with one of the, the people uh, who are presenting in this conference. He's working for a great company, web page, has huge team, distributed team. And he tells me that they don't have video conferencing. So I thought, well, maybe I need to to talk about that a little bit. Because what happens when we are doing conferences without video? When we're doing the classic conference calls? Well, we're not in the conference call. <laughs> you know, we're working, we're sending emails, we're making food, making food. We are eating, we're going to the bathroom while we're in a conference. Good, good, we're paying a lot of attention. We need to kill conference calls. It's something that we inherited from the past. It's no longer valid. It used to work very well in the past because, you know, construction manager calls. I need five tons of bricks. Okay, sir, we'll send you a fax with a PO order, uh, with a purchase order right away. Fax. Then phone worked then because that person was just making a. Um, an order, but now we are collaborating with people and phone doesn't work anymore. We're trying to build something with people and conference calls are just, there's something from the past. We need to ditch them and we need to move 
to the new technologies. They're there. Why aren't we using them? Why is this person that I was telling you about having problems working with video? Why is his company telling him he cannot use Skype? Use video, OK? 80% um, of the message we receive comes from body language. Unless you have a Darth Vader, like here, uh, we, you can see people normally, you get more information. Why would we say no to more information? Why would we say no to something as natural as seeing people? Let's use the tools that we have. Let's be a little professional here. Um, uh, some more communication uh, tips. Be warm. Oh, we talk about, about uh, writing emails where we have an introduction. D have you read this Tom Ferry's book, um, Four Hour Work Week? No? Good. Don't do it. <laughs> you have. Terrible. He says, I have an assistant in China, and the key is that I don't say hi to her. OK, I'm very productive. I don't say hi to my assistant. <laughs> The fuck? Yeah, not even there. Because uh, how do you think the girl in China feels? She wants to kill herself. Um, get personal, you know, provide regular feedback. Team leaders are always available. Okay, if you're working in different time zones, not always available, but always available in a time frame or in a, in a channel. You know, that person is there to serve the, the, the person who's distributed. So uh, make yourself available and document everything. Another motivational killer, Ooh. Um, loneliness. It happens, right? We're remotely, maybe we're working with two other people in the company, but we start to feel lonely. Promote virtual water coolers. In a normal office, a water co cooler or a coffee machine or a cigarette break, whatever you want to call it, it's a moment where we establish a connection with people that work with us, maybe not from the same department. We need to find a way to emulate that in uh, the virtual world. And there's already a lot of uh, softwares that show you the virtual office in the, on the screen and that have um, real, well, real, virtual water coolers. If you don't have that, just allow your, the people in your team to meet, you know, to go on Skype or Google Hangouts for a while and just talk, you know, spare 10 minutes of their time so they can relax and talk about whatever they want. It can be project related or not, but make that happen. And break the virtual world. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying that I prefer to spend my money in, in the people in my team, in creating an environment. I don't want to give it to the airlines. Uh, so pay for co-working spaces. I know there's some in Zagreb, not so many. Mm, I don't know if it's because they're expensive or what, but if you have a chance, if your company is not providing you with an office, go work at a co-working space. You'll meet designers, you'll meet other developers, you'll meet architects. It's, it's good, it's fun, it's people who are also working remotely. And if it happens that there's people in your team that are in the same region, go ahead, you know, let them meet, pay for that. Something that worked really well for us is uh, private social media. So we have a social media inside the company where we only share what we want. And it's, it's a moment for the people in the team to relax and to get to know each other better. For example, here's Bart. He asks me, Anna, can I take a month and a half off? Of course. What are you going to do? Go on an excavation project in Poland, my country. Fun. Comes back, shows us the photos. You know, we, now I know something else from Bart. I got a little bit closer. Um, to him, and that makes my work relation with him better. Activities. To, if people in the team are feeling a little bit detached, it's great to find activities uh, where they're going to feel some kind of identification with the company. This is one I particularly like. This is an activity where you meet with, and I have it here too, where you meet with your team and you say, okay, what would the ideal team member be like? And you would say all the characteristics of the ideal team member. And at the end, you come up with a stick figure that has those characteristics or objects that talk about the characteristics. Then you give the stick figure to the designer of the company or to a designer, and they come up with this. So this is Collabora. 
and they decided that they were really uh, fast and agile and that they were uh, very smooth and that nobody could, to, could find them and that their main tools were code and the keyboard and they had a little antenna because they were working with a lot of uh, radio TV stations at the moment. So they come up with this. This is something really cool. This is the team. This is what I want to be. And it's, it's a cool ninja. So then you can put that in your presentations. Every different team in the company can have their own mascot. Uh, you can make the mascot do different things. Uh, you can have one for the beginning of the project, one uh, during the sprints. You know, it's these activities. I know that as managers, sometimes they're a little bit cheesy or it's like, oh, I have to do an activity. Or it's hard because you don't know you don't know your role, you know. It's not easy to facilitate activities. So, uh, but try it. In our webpage here, Managing Virtual Teams, you have like 400 of activities, they're free. It's, it's a database, you can filter by how long the activity is going to be, what the objective is, and then it will give you a list of activities with clear methodology. Go there and uh, use them. They're really useful to increase motivation, to increase communication. Identification. Okay, let's finish. Beating boredom. It happens. People are far and boredom happens. In normal companies, I think the average is one year and a half until the first sign of boredom appears. In distributed teams, it's nine months. So people get bored really fast. How do you beat that? Promoting participation in transversal projects. So allow people that for a small percentage, let's say 20% of their time, that they do something else that's not strictly related to the project. And it, com it can go from being part of an integration team to following their other me's. So if I am really into yoga, maybe I can teach yoga to the rest of the team virtually. Um, if I wanted to study journalism, maybe I can write a company newsletter. If uh, I'm really into manuals and documenting everything, maybe I can help with the processes of the company. So let people work in transversal projects, mainly because they will know other people and they'll feel a little bit more fulfilled. Do contests, and contests not when there's a solo winner, where the team is the winner. You know this, huh? If you only have one winner, you have 10 losers. You want to have the team winning. Le let people change projects, provide that growth we were talking about, and do activities outside the project. So when people are near the boredom, they can escape and find a way out. Quickly to finish, motivation drivers, besides all the ones we talked about, provide development, provide empowerment. When you say thank you, explain why. And why I think it's, it's the big word of this Year. All the conferences have this word in it. Why? Explain why. There's always a reason why you're thanking that person. Sometimes it's just that they heard that they were listening to you. Sometimes it's because I did something really great. You know, you didn't have to send me that so fast. Thank you for doing that. Acknowledge why you are saying thank you. That will give meaning to the person. Use the one-to-one -one meetings to gather information. Use the team activities to gather information. All the time, you need to know what, what makes your team thrive, and you need to connect to that. And show you care. Get personal. You will have a lot of information. You will know what TV shows they like. You will know what books they like. Send them real gifts. And I'm not talking about company mug, company t-shirt. I'm talking about real things that I care about. If during a meeting we said that last night I watched Game of Thrones, maybe my manager all of a sudden, out of the blue, sends me the box. You know, if in the last meeting I said I want to read this book, wow, how great it is that somebody in my team sends me that book. And today it's really easy. Uh, or if somebody, you know, some, you know somebody that wants to lose weight or they're trying to eat healthier, send them a fruit basket. Breaking the virtual world is amazing. Uh, when you send a person, a UPS guy, on the door of somebody that's working virtually, you blow their minds off because they're not expecting that. And we're talking about things that are 20 euros. We're not talking about big presents, just small things that show you care and you get a closer connection with that person and that person's going to work better with you. You're not buying people, you're just connecting with them. Now, motivation drivers, have fun, huh? 
This is super important. If you don't have fun, people are going to leave your company. And they're, because we like to have fun. So do things together. Create playlists. Playlists for when we are starting the project. Playlists for when we're almost done. Create play, um, telegram groups, photo contest. Here, we use the photo contest for the World Cup. If we are distributed in 25 different teams, what do we have in common? Soccer. OK, it doesn't happen every year. But here, you know, we can show how we're celebrating that. What else do we have in common? In our cities, we have graffitis. So let's show the graffitis and let's show them to everybody there. Or um, let's get a little bit more personal. What was my best moment of 2014? When you're working with people from 25 different countries, it's so cool. It was, you're so curious. I want to know what their house is like. I want to know what their family is like. They're so different from me. So things like photo contests that in normal offices are kind of, uh, here they have real meaning. You know, here Remy from the Netherlands runs a marathon. And the entire team decides this is the coolest photo of the year because the guy ran a marathon. You know, this creates bonding. And with the bonding, you will have more more uh, effective teams, teams that are performing better because they're having fun. These are some specific tools. I will put this on SlideShare. You can uh, take a look at them later. And um, with all the knowledge that we acquired at Ricari's and with all these activities that I told you about, what we did was a spin-off. We said, OK, let's use all this knowledge and let's bring it to companies who have distributed teams who are struggling with that. And now we offer this service. We have, um, we do team activities, we facilitate team activities. And what we're doing now, if you want me or somebody in your team to com come to your company virtually and meet with your team and do an activity, an activity to improve communication, an activity to improve synergy, wherever you want, we can do that. And we're offering this one activity for free, no commitment just for the fun. If you're interested, I have a sign up form here. You can give me your email. We can talk about what you want to achieve with the activity. And maybe you can learn and improve your team a little bit like that. So thank you very much. I don't know if we have time for questions. I guess not. Organization? Nobody? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, you need to, to define what you want to achieve, I would say first, and then just try to be regular with it. So, and you will need some flexibility from the team too, especially if you're working with different time zones. Like the monthly Congress that we do, um, there we ask people to be a little bit flexible. Normally in normal meetings, we try to st stick to the, to the work schedule, but in the monthly Congress, it's, it's a meeting that lasts you know, three, four hours, you know. So sometimes it's, it's at night or you, people have to wake up a little bit earlier, but it's so much fun that people are just commitment, committed and it doesn't happen that often. But uh, I would say stick to regular things because if you do one thing one time, it's just, you know, one flower. In Spain, we say one flower doesn't make spring. So <laughs> you need something that you're working on all the time. You need to make people used to these changes that you're trying to incorporate, used to the new way of thinking in distributed teams and all the procedures, all these ideas that you have, all these rituals that you have, try to, to make them solid and regular. I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Uh, how do you document processes? You said that you have to have everything very well documented because all the, the people and some of the fluctuations. Mm -hmm. It's great. So how do you do that? How do you keep the knowledge documented? With a wiki. wiki. Yes. I mean, but to me, uh, it's always a problem for a new person what he comes and reads everything. No. No. 
it's not re he reads everything, is that during the first two weeks, we go through this um, good vibes handbook that we call it. And it's not a reading process, it's a process where we explain, where we give examples. And where the most important thing in that process is not so much what you're reading, is that you can know you can change that any moment that you want. Because while we ex read this with them, we say, ah, and this point was added two weeks ago by this person who's going to be in your team. And this was added. Uh, six months ago by this other person that this is. So we give examples of how they can retro element, you know, like uh, retrofit the, you the document. Approval, approval on what, what goes into wiki? Do you have some kind of thing approval? Yes. Yes, there's uh, the two psychologists that work with us. They rephrase things a little bit to make them more open, more understanding. Yes, yes, yeah. How do you manage <coughs> over time? Because most, most of I'm not working in a distributed team, mm. but when I'm working on my own or I'm not working at home, I just go with the flow. Mm -hmm. So I forget about time and there is a danger of overrun. Mm. Because most of the time you just go and you work and you work and how do you manage that and how do you control that one? Because when you're working on your own, there is nobody to tell you, okay, everybody yes. going home and yes. you're working and you feel ashamed. Yes. <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely right. You tend to work more hours. You tend to work on weekends sometimes. So we try to teach people um, about breaks, about the need to put to take off your pajamas. Put on. Yes. To complete the task. Yes, yes, to yes. The task. So we teach, a, we talk a lot to them about the need to take days off, the need to stop working when, if you're working from home, for example, if you're a freelancer or simply you work from home, to have a separate space if possible. You know, to clean your desks uh, after you are done with work, so you don't feel the temptation to go back to the computer and reply to that extra email. So you know, tomorrow I. So we, it's. A, it's a culture thing. We repeat, we give examples, and we have had so many congresses where we talked about this. It's not a one-time thing. It's something that we always repeat because it happens. You, it's so easy to, to send that email out and tomorrow I'll focus on other things. So it's a repetition. Yes? Uh, um, when, you, uh, when you talk about uh, working time, which is available for, for every team member, uh, how many uh, how, how many percentage is spent on the activities, okay. and not on doing the uh, concrete uh, tasks? Um, I don't have the percentage exactly, but if I had to give you a number, I'd From, I'd say it's maybe five percent. It's it's not very much, but it makes a difference especially with these daily meetings or weekly meetings, to be able to spend five minutes on just doing small talk. It really makes a difference. And it, it, you don't have to invest a lot of time. So no. all activities except, I suppose, a monthly conference. Mm. Yes. 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 OK. Yes. No, no, you, you. Si. I meant uh, as they uh, work like a person, uh, how, how, let's say, autonomous they are. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we have virtual things and we have to really work not on daily basis, but on hourly basis. Mm -hmm. And it's, we don't ha have time to, you know, do all these nice meetings. We have things to do. You, know, you do have time. <laughs> no, no. no, no, you have time. Oh. End of the story. If you want to have a good relation with the people you're working with, you have to find time. And I don't mean half an hour there. Uh, no. Just, just the small talk, you know, just start the day. Maybe you are only going to do the small talk, the first call you do with a person, but do it. And then the rest of the day, you don't have to. But you need to find the time. Otherwise, it's, it's going to provoke this lack of communication. It's, in the long run, it's not going to be sustainable. And you're going to be more efficient. You're going to be working better because you'll have an easier connection with the person. They'll, they'll know better what you mean and you'll know better how to read them, I think, based on my experience. <laughs> Another question? How do you cancel children's noise in the background? <laughs> oh, you lock yourself in the closet. <laughs> That's the only way. <laughs> OK, well, thank you very much. We go for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>
And what do you think we are back?